uh, want to welcome everyone to the aquatic species um, session of the, the conference here. Uh, my name is Chris Steffen. I'm the Aquatic Nuisance Species Coordinator for Kansas Wildlife and Parks, and I'll be moderating the, the session today. Um, some, some quick housekeeping here. Um, please turn off your microphone. Um, if you have a question, please enter it in the chat function at the bottom of the screen here. Um, we're going to go through the presentation and then do the questions at the end. So if you enter it in the chat as we're going, uh, I'm going to read those at the end of, of the presentations. Um, and I guess uh, with that, we're going to move on to our first presentation, um, which will be uh, from Mark Van Skoyek. Uh, Mark is the biodiversity survey coordinator, aquatic ecologist for the ecological services section of Kansas Wildlife and Parks. Mark graduated from Fort Hayes State University with a bachelor's degree in business and biology, a master's in business administration, and conducted graduate work in fisheries management. As biodiversity survey coordinator, he manages grant funds for the statewide survey of non-game fish and wildlife species. This includes coordinating with survey biologists regarding the selection of species to be surveyed, as well as methods and procedures for the collection of relevant data to inform and update the state wildlife action plan. Additionally, Mark conducts ecological reviews for the western part of Kansas to assess potential impacts to critical habitats of sensitive species and oversees the issuance of and administration of education, exhibition, collection, and salvage permits by the department. Well, Mark, that sounds like about five jobs uh, <laughs> to have you here. Uh, and I'll just let you jump into it. Okay, good morning all. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share some of the things we're doing uh, with the department and within ecological services. Um, just this morning, I'm going to cover uh, some thing we've been working on, a conservation agreement, uh, basically involving kind of recovery of species in the state of Kansas, uh, recovery of both uh, state and federally listed species. Uh, so with that, we'll just kind of jump into it right now. Uh, we're looking at... Uh, um, developing this, these agreements for 14 aquatic species here in the state. And as you, many of you know, or may not know, we do have an uh, aquatic biodiversity center located in Farlington Fish Hatchery in the Southeast uh, uh, area of the state. Uh, it's kind of provided us kind of that, uh, uh, that infrastructure for producing, for pr propagating uh, imperiled species across the state. Um, They've had some great successes at uh, starting to rear some of these species of concern that uh, we list in our state wildlife action plan. Um, on the other side, what we've been working on from ecological services is more of kind of a, uh, the agreement tool side or the non, you know, kind of that non, more of logistical support for that, uh, developing agreements. Um, as far as that goes, there are many tools available uh, you know, for species recovery um, out of the, and this is just an example uh, that one of my colleagues shared with me, uh, out of all the species that are imperiled from this graph, you can see kind of this continuum of some of the different options that are available, habitat conservation plans, safe harbor agreements, recovery plans, uh, all those are more geared towards uh, some of the more threatened or endangered species, those state conservation agreements and some of those traditional fish and wildlife plans uh, kind of are, are geared towards more of those non-imperiled or more of those uh, sport fish uh, or sport type species uh, for consumptive purposes. Um, what I'm going to be discussing is something that kind of covers the broad realm of both, uh, whether they are abundant, you know, whether they are something that occurs in the state, uh, candidate conservation agreements uh, and safe harbor agreements, which, as you can see from the graph, kind of, kind of encompass all of that continuum there. Um, but really, what we're focusing on with, with this uh, discussion is the tool of conservation on private lands. Um, and one of the things in, in a state where the land is 95 to 97 percent privately owned, I don't, don't quote me on that, but that's just a rough estimate. 
uh, it is going to be critical to establish relationships with our private landowners uh, to uh, give them assurances that there's not going to be they're not going to be overregulated if they enter into agreements with the state or with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, ensuring to them that their everyday practices are not going to be uh, at risk, that they can still make a living, being transparent with them up front about all the, uh, some of the activities that we would like them to do, what we, uh, what we assure them that they can still continue to do, uh, while at the same time avoiding minimizing or mitigating impacts or threats uh, to the habitat and the species as much as possible. Uh, all in all, bottom line is enabling people to continue their, uh, their everyday life their, their, their well-being and allowing these economic activities to continue and proceed while at the same time uh, implementing good conservation practices and recovery on these landscapes. So what we did was develop an agreement, kind of a two-part agreement, um, and I could sit here, if I said programmatic safe harbor agreement and candidate conservation agreement, with assurances for 14 species in the state of Kansas, aquatic species, that'd probably take up about half the time I have to talk. So when you hear me refer to SHA or CCAA, those are the acronyms that we all love to use in this line of work. Uh, but as you can see, these are, uh, these are some of the species, these are the 14 species that uh, we decided upon uh, as far as uh, implementing under these agreements. Uh, there are 14 total. Uh, right now, five of them are federally listed. Uh, nine of them are state listed. Uh, two of those um, are federal candidates at this point in time. So, um, and, and I'll discuss kind of the differences uh, between the two of these. We'll just start right off. One exactly is a candidate conservation agreement. Um, the main focus is looking at those non-federally listed species. In this case, uh, Kansas has its own Endangered Species Act, the Non-Game Act of 1974, and uh, it focuses on those species that may become federally listed or candidate species in the future. Um, the whole idea behind this is to, again, provide these landowners some of those regulatory assurances that we're not going to uh, tell them that they cannot perform their normal farming and ranching practices or everyday uh, operations in order to make a living. Uh, and it does, in a sense, authorize a level of take uh, in these habitats. And for those of you unfamiliar with that definition, take is a very broad term, uh, according under the ESA, the Federal Endangered Species Act, it's to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, collect, pretty broad. Now, that includes if you uh, look at impacts to the landscape, that can be also construed as take any uh, activities that potentially impact the species. Uh, so Canada, CCAAs, non-federally listed species. Safe harbor agreements, on the other hand, uh, provide assurances for recovery efforts for those species that are already uh, federally listed as threatened or endangered. Uh, under those agreements, landowners uh, have a list of covered activities which are agreed upon before they enter into the agreement on that initial concert, uh, consultation. Uh, there are visits that are performed, uh, lots of upfront to discussions between the landowner uh, and the uh, and the in our sense, in our case, us as the, uh, as the uh, other party to the agreement. Uh, at the end of that agreement, if, uh, uh, if the landowner does not wish to continue participating in this uh, agreement, all, all conditions go back to that baseline condition prior to the agreement being signed. Um, now, encompassing all of these, uh, especially with the safe harbor agreement, is an issuance of what's known as an enhancement of survival permit, which is, uh, comes under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Uh, it basically allows for landowners to improve habitat on their own property for listed species uh, without having to be unduly restricted, uh, no matter if the area occupied by the species increases or the number of those, uh, the number of those uh, animals increase on that property. They're not going to be further restricted. Uh, this is issued to KDWP. We are the, um, we are the Enhancement of Survival Permit holder uh, by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. To build upon that, once a landowner enters into that uh, uh, 
a CCAA or SHA with us, uh, they are issued a certificate of inclusion or a COI, another acronym. Uh, it's signed by both the landowner and uh, uh, the KDWP, and uh, it demonstrates that they will they are an enrolled property in this agreement, in this enhancement of survival. Uh, it does, as I mentioned before, allows incidental take to occur uh, for other for lawful activities. Now, they can't go and build a watershed dam on their property. That's not considered a lawful activity. We're talking normal farming and ranching practices and those activities that were agreed upon uh, at the development of the agreement. Um, some of these landowner insurances, uh, again, the cooperator is not required to implement additional conservation measures uh, under the CCAA uh, beyond those that were already agreed upon at the beginning of the agreement. Uh, for, the, for the SHA, at the end of that agreement, they can return those conditions uh, of the site back to the original condition. Uh, all the species we can, there is the option for uh, uh, the other party, us as KDWP, to come in and remove any species that are on the property, basically returning everything to a baseline of zero type conditions. Uh, and since aquatic species do not recognize property boundaries, uh, those assurances will carry over to neighboring landowners. Um, we're not expecting aquatic species to just stay in segments on those areas of land where those uh, where those agreements have been signed. Uh, so, you know, and if if I go through some of this and if I don't have concrete answers for you, uh, please be patient with us this is a new process, fairly innovative for the department. Um, we're not aware of really any other agreements out there uh, that th there are CCAs and SHAs uh, out west and across the nation, but very few of them occur at a statewide level. The only other one we're aware of is the state of South Carolina, which is working on a similar type uh, uh, instrument for their own purposes. Um, this started back in around June of 2020. Uh, we published it in the Federal Register. Uh, we've been working on it with a firm called ICF um, to kind of do some of the, the nuts and bolts writing of the document. Uh, it was, uh, like I said, put in the register middle of September. Comments were solicited from the public due by mid-October. Addressing those public comments, we're still in the process of kind of finalizing some of the fine points of the agreements. Uh, my colleague Darren Riddle has, uh, in the office next to me uh, is, has been working on this. And in fact, we have a meeting today to discuss some uh, SHPO requirements uh, with the feds uh, about uh, these agreements. Hopefully we can get this all taken care of and done by the end of 2021. Uh, what's next after that is implementation, which means that uh, you know, we have several staff here in, uh, in ecological services to coordinate research. They uh, collect genetic data. Our survey crews are collecting uh, genetic data as well as information to identify where uh, stream segments could possibly uh, be utilized for release of these species, finding brood stock to take to our aquatic biodiversity center uh, where they are producing these species uh, under, this, uh, under this agreement. Uh, and ultimately, this program is going to require a recovery coordinator. Uh, it's going to require uh, some additional bodies uh, in the field to work with the biodiversity center about release plans, where to release them, um, but most importantly, uh, developing and nurturing that database of uh, contacts and communications with our landowners so we can negotiate them, be transparent and upfront with them is going to be key uh, and work with our survey crews, uh, work with the landowners to allow survey crews back onto the property for not only collecting broodstock or releasing, but for monitoring to see the success, whether these species are recovering or not. Um, and that individual will also be responsible for annual reporting. So a lot of things to cover a lot of, in a short period of time. Uh, and with that, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to throw them at me later. And I thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, we actually do have some time now for a few questions if anyone's got any. Um, I guess I'll start you off with one here, Mark. Sure. Um, 
you had added, had mentioned added positions to take on this work. Um, is there a plan in place for that, or is that something um, you envision happening with uh, uh, looking to the future with the Recovering Amer America's Wildlife Act? Is that a plan for for if RAWA gets passed? Good point. I mean, yeah, uh, that's we don't really have anything in place now. There is going to be a need for that really before there's any meaningful recovery. I mean, we're still testing the waters on, you know, uh, where we're going to be getting species from, you know, going across state lines, that's a whole different, uh, that's a whole different venue to consider, consider there whether or not there's going to be permits necessary for that. Um, but yeah, uh, we do envision Rawa being a big part uh, of affecting some of that recovery through this program. Fantastic. Any other questions for Mark? The, the chat should be open uh, below, or if you want to, you can unmute, should be able to unmute yourself and ask a question too. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna let you off easy here, Mark. Uh, All right, no one's no one's had enough coffee yet, so I'll I'll leave it at that. If anyone uh, has questions that come up for Mark later, you can get a hold of me or or someone with the water office, and we can get those to Mark. Or you should be able to um, find him uh, through the directory with uh, Kansas Wildlife and Parks. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, we're gonna move on to our our next speaker here. Um, our next speaker is um, Brian Sowards with Kansas Wildlife Parks and Tourism, or I guess just Wildlife and Parks now. Um, we can see that, Brian. I'll give uh, Brian's bio here, but again, um, if you have questions that come up during the presentation, feel free to uh, Put them in the chat at the bottom and, and we'll handle all the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, Brian Sowards is the Assistant Director of Fish Culture and Management for Kansas Wildlife and Parks. The position is responsible for overseeing four state fish hatcheries and fish community and population management of the state's 450 public fishing impoundments. Formerly, Brian spent two years as the fisheries program specialist and six years as a fisheries biologist for Kansas Wildlife and Parks. Prior to that, he was a research scientist for the Natural Resource Institute at Texas A&M University and studied ecological parameters of freshwater mussels throughout Texas. He received a BS and MS in biological sciences from Fort Hayes State University in 2008 and 2012 respectively. Uh, recently married, Brian enjoys spending time fishing with his wife, Allison, and dog Rose at Wilson Reservoir. Uh, and today, uh, Brian is going to present on advancements and challenges for raising, of raising for Kansas anglers uh, and for conservation. Raising fish, sorry. I think, think I'd have that word down. Uh, anyway, welcome, Brian. Uh, we're looking forward to your presentation here, and when you're ready, take it away. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, this is going to be like a five, 10,000 foot view of fish management and fish culture for Kansas Wildlife and Parks, but I wanted to focus on the production of fish um, in terms of the advancements and the challenges that we face going forward. So fisheries management in Kansas, this is gonna be very brief, but, but our biologists out there, we have 17 of them throughout the state. They each have a district ranging from, you know, a couple of counties to 20 some counties uh, in Western Kansas where there's, where there's less water. But, but what we're doing is we're using um, standardized techniques, whether it be electro fishing in the spring for largemouth bass and bluegill or using gill nets and pike nets in the fall for crappie, um, walleye, sawgye, white bass, wipers, catfish, those sorts of things. We're using those American Fisheries Society standard techniques to monitor those populations. And we're looking, you know, essentially at, at catch rates, but also the link frequencies 
in the, of those populations. So we can look at natural reproduction or see if natural reproduction and recruitment are occurring annually, um, how often they're occurring. Um, and if we do see gaps in those populations or those, those, um, those young of the year fish, those recruitment years, we typically can, can do some things like request fish from our, our, our state fish hatcheries. And that way we can bolster those populations and continue um, having fish for anglers in the future. But we use the, those data to, to determine, you know, if we need to stock fish, how many we need to stock. Um, and we also have, we use creel information, whether it's statewide creel, uh, this information here is from the 2013 licensed angler survey, um, but we, we could use statewide data or either reservoir specific data to determine what anglers want and how many fish they harvest. But this example here is statewide uh, species preference throughout the uh, state of Kansas. So you can see largemouth bass was ranked as number one, crappie two, channel catfish three, walleye four, and then the flathead at number five. So we can get an idea of what our anglers in the state are looking for. Um, and again, you can look at water, water body specific information. And this example here is from Hillsdale Reservoir. You can see the crappie ranked number one, catfish two, uh, no preference, meaning they're just out there to catch whatever, channel catfish at four and large at five. So we can use this information um, and also harvest information. This is hybrid striped bass from Canopolis Reservoir. You can see, you know, what, how harvest changes year to year. And, you know, in 2017, you can see how it really drops off. That might be another way to determine whether you need to stock those fish again. So using the creel information and using the fisheries data um, developed in the field, you can determine what species you want to stock and how many. We have four state fish hatcheries in the state, Mead in the Southwest, Pratt in South Central at the headquarters, and Milford Reservoir is below Milford Dam at Milford Lake, and Farlington is below Crawford State Fishing Lake in Southeast Kansas. This is uh, data from last year, 2020, the species that were produced at those four fish hatcheries. These are just the five highest. We produce a lot of different species, but these are the ones we produce the most of. Um, walleye, we produce 38 million, uh, sawguy 13 and a half, down to 1.6 million largemouth bass last year. And these vary in sizes from fry, which is, you know, the, the size of a pencil eraser to fingerlings, a couple inches long. We also produce, you know, adults and intermediates as well. Okay, here's some advancements in fish culture we've made over the, over the last decade. You can see how I mentioned largemouth bass was the number one preferred species in the state. Um, so we really wanted to emphasize more production of largemouth bass. And our goal was to increase the number and, and even the size of largemouth bass in our reservoirs and our state fishing lakes and other public impoundments. But the challenge has been poor historical stocking success. We can stock largemouth bass, but typically if we don't have the right habitat or the right water level conditions, sometimes those stockings just are ineffective. So what we've, what we've developed was an early spawn largemouth bass facility. We've gained, got some information from uh, biologists in Florida that have been doing something similar um, in terms of growing and producing largemouth bass earlier than they would in the wild. And here's an example of that, that facility. Um, it's at the, again, the Mead State Fish Hatchery. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking brood stock that have actually been genetically identified. I won't talk a whole lot about that, but, um, and we move them into the hatchery facility in, you know, March, you know, earlier than they would normally stock uh, or normally reproduce in the wild. And so then we're able to manipulate water temperature, manipulate the, uh, the daily amount of light we have in the building. And so we're able to actually get them to spawn and produce fry um, four to six weeks earlier than they would in the wild. And so when we stock them, they're, they have a significant advantage in terms of, of growth because they have four to six more weeks to grow as long as there's food available for them. So we're trying to use that as a, to get through those bottlenecks that have hampered the stocking success of largemouth bass in the past. 
And our next advancement has been our walleye initiative. I don't know why I have, uh, have to click on each of these, but anyway, uh, we have the Kansas walleye initiative that we implemented a few years ago. Um, and the goal here is to increase the number of walleye that we produce and are available to anglers. Well, the challenge here again has been poor recruitment um, and stocking success recruitment and wild recruitment. It's just reservoir sedimentation, um, changes in water quality over the last you know, 40, 50 years has really led to more inconsistent recruitment of walleye in our, in our reservoirs. So we really need to rely on stocking a little more if we want to provide those for the anglers in the future. And another challenge is we do have limited space at our hatcheries. Um, we only have so many acres of ponds available to grow these things and then produce them for our, for our fisheries. So one of the advancements is a walleye larva culture where we can grow these things in tanks indoors um, at a fairly high rates and not rely on just sur surface water at our hatchery. So it gives us an additional number of fish that we can produce every year um, within a confined setting. And we can also grow those in tanks up to intermediate size, that six to nine inch range. Um, and, and hopefully they'll have more likelihood of survival when they grow to those larger sizes. That's typically the case. And here's just shows a few pictures of, uh, of a rudimentary. I say that just by looking on the outside, but you go inside, it's a fairly sophisticated system they've developed there at Mead to where they're controlling so many things. They're controlling so it's a recirculating aquaculture system, but they're controlling, you know, the amount of dissolved oxygen uh, every every hour, every day, and they're controlling the amount of uh, biological material. Um, they've got um, ozone, ultraviolet um, radiation, and those things to limit the amount of biological uh, materials they have in the water to increase water quality. Um, they also put in a specific amount of dissolved oxygen. It's a whole, and they also have mechanical filters, filter drums, and those sorts of things to uh, really keep the water water clean and, and and healthy for the fish to grow. So it's a lot of different steps. It's an intensive system, but so far it's working out. It's working out fairly well. We have worked out some kinks over the years, and it's starting to starting to be able to produce the, somewhere between fifteen and thirty thousand uh, walleye every year, on top of what we can produce in our surface. Now we're hoping to increase that quite a bit um, through a new walleye larva culture and intermediate facility there at Mead Hatchery as well. Um, and you can see here that there, there's several large uh, grow out tanks and larva culture tanks. Um, it's a fairly sophisticated building, maybe the most sophisticated building that Wildlife and Parks has ever built and had engineered. So it, it, there's a lot of hiccups with this right now in the development stages. But we're hoping by maybe not this production season, but the one after that, we can start producing a lot more walleye, both uh, both fried, um, or excuse me, fingerlings and intermediate production. And this kind of ties into what uh, Mark Manskoik was talking about was uh, our Kansas Aquatic Biodiversity Center. But uh, one of the advancements we've made um, in response to the plight of our aquatic native species. Um, is to just produce them and hopefully we can produce them and now we have these safe harbor agreements and uh, uh, CCAAs in place that we can start producing and uh, and stocking these individuals in private land. Hey, here's just an example of, of one of the driving forces or impetus for this building was Again, the plight of those aquatic native species. You can see freshwater mussels, turtles, and, and freshwater fish are some of the most imperiled species or groups of species in the nation. So we're hoping we can start targeting some of those. Uh, that, there's, a, there's the building that Mark showed. And now I'm going to talk about some challenges with the time I have left. There's Mead State Fishery. Uh, fish hatchery in southwest Kansas and southwest Kansas obviously water quantity is a big concern. It was built there in the 1930s um, because there was a lot of artesian flows. It seemed like a good place to have water to grow fish um, but by the 70s and 80s that water pretty much disappeared and uh, the ponds have started to dry up. They're, they're 
there's a lot of leaky ponds and those things out there. And so, let me go back. And so over the years, we've used um, a lot of available tools like uh, using soda ash to roll into um, our, our ponds there to eliminate a lot of that water loss. Um, and so now we've got a lot of surface water available and reliable water as in the past, you know, we would go through water um, before the season was over and we couldn't produce any more fish. So we've got, uh, we've got a lot of that shored up um, and to, to kind of counteract that water loss, but, but meat hatchery is producing a lot more fish than it used to and it's in pretty good shape. Uh, Milford hatchery again is below the Milford Lake. You can see there's a number of wasteways and a big intensive facility there on the, on the bottom right. But some of the challenges there are poor surface water quality. I know KDHE and the Corps of Engineers have been working with us there on a pilot project for uh, hydrogen peroxide there to kind of eliminate some of the blue-green algae or resting blue-green algae. But unionized ammonia and those harmful algal blooms are a constant uh, annual concern there, and it seems like it might be getting worse. So. And also a high water well use. Um, the energy consumption there is about $125,000 a year, give or take. And so that, that's a big concern. And then, like I mentioned, it was below the dam at Milford, which has zebra mussels. So that's another concern. There's potential for infestation. Ang uh, anglers or whatever can move uh, bait bucket introduction into the surface water um, pond that Milford gets its water from. And could infest the whole system that way and then we'd have a big problem on our hands so there's there's several challenges we're dealing with at milford um, pratt state hatchery our oldest hatchery it's why the headquarters is here at pratt um, has 80 some ponds and it's all surface water and those ponds are, are tied together one, one of the challenges is the aging infrastructure because it was built in 1912 but also the heavy reliance on surface water all the ponds like i've mentioned are, are essentially connected so so you could get, you know, from one pond to the next, you could get uh, infestation that way. So they take a lot of time to, to manage those ponds and what they put in ponds below this pond, you know, keep species kind of separated that way. Um, so it is a logistical challenge. And there is white perch in the Ninnesca River, which feeds those ponds. And, and those white perch are located several miles downstream, but there's also potential for infestation. And Farlington Fish Hatchery, you can see these uh, ponds located below Crawford State Fish and Lake, which would be on the far right of that picture. Um, some of the challenges there, this was built in the 1940s as a federal fish hatchery, and then I think sold over to the state in the 70s, I think. And so again, aging infrastructure and a heavy reliance on surface water. Um, there is limited annual use of water from Crawford State Fish and Lake, so that does kind of hamper the amount of ponds we can use for the full year. So, and there's again, potential for contamination. And uh, the Kansas Biodiversity Center, those, some of those challenges were how to produce these rare species. Some of them we have a lot of information on from other hatcheries, but a lot of them we're gonna face a lot of challenges in, just in terms of producing those fish um, or mussels or turtles, whatever it is. And where to stock these TNE species. Uh, Mark covered a lot of that. We're kind of jumping over some of those hurdles with the SHAs and CCAAs. So that's good. We can, if we get those things in place, I think we can really start producing some species and stocking them in the wild. So how we kind of see the future of our fish culture system going in Kansas is trying to put a little more emphasis and expanding facilities for these RAS recirculating aquaculture systems. One of the things those does is it, it allows you, if you remember the meat example, it allows you to control a lot of outside factors. You know, you're not dealing with, with you know, freak weather events or dissolved oxygen crashes or, or things like that. You can control that water a lot better with intensive facilities. And you're also, you know, really saving the amount of water you use in a year, which would, you know, save you on a lot of pumping costs, but, but really save you on the amount of water. You use. And, and to save on costs, we are looking into maybe using solar at a lot of, uh, at least at Farlington and Milford hatcheries, where, where we do have some intensive systems in place. 
And again, more emphasis towards conservation, whether it's just with the KABC building, but we could see some more potential uh, expansion to other facilities, uh, either Pratt, Mead, Milford, whatever it is, especially if the, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act goes through and, and the state is flush with $18, $19 million, there might be more potential to expand those, um, those production facilities for, for t and &E species or candidate species for their conservation. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. Um, we did have one question come up in the chat while you were talking and we're hoping uh, you can address this here. Uh, what do you mean by poor recruitment? Is that referring to naturally sustaining populations? Yeah, am I still unmuted? Yep, we can hear you. Um, poor recruitment is just that Essentially, what you'd like to see is a population that reproduces and has fish survive the winter. Those, those young of year, age zero fish, survive the winter and make it to the next year. Um, that's essentially what I mean by recruitment is their survival of fish reproduced that year that make it on to the next year. And what we've seen with a lot of our populations, um, whether it's sedimentation or changes in water quality, drought conditions, whatever those environmental or abiotic conditions are, can, can really have an impact on, on recruitment. Some year you just don't get wild recruitment. Uh, the next year conditions line up just right and you'll get recruitment. So we, we deal with inconsistent recruitment isn't necessarily a bad thing until you get two, three, four years where you're not producing any fish. And, and you really need to start getting those fish from the hatcheries. Fantastic. Um, any other questions for Brian? Not, not seeing any, Brian. All right. We appreciate the information. That was fantastic. It's uh, great to uh, have you in your new position and, and, uh, there sure is a lot of a lot of different projects going on there so it's fantastic to get an update thanks chris